All right, so welcome to the marine biology course. What we're going to be talking about here in the first chapter, chapter one, is the basic science of marine biology. And what does it mean to be a marine biologist? What do they do? What do they study? What, what is marine biology? So once we get a feel for that, it'll help us hopefully have a better understanding of what we're doing while we're taking the course and while we're doing our time in the ocean, spending time studying actually out in the field. The book we're using is Marine Biology by Peter Castro and Michael Huber, and it is the 8th edition. I chose that edition because I wanted to use a book that was a lot more affordable for you guys versus the 10th edition, which is over $200. So this is the correct book. That is the cover title. The bookstore at the college will have copies, used copies for you, or feel free. Go to Google, Amazon, Chegg, wherever. But you guys will need the textbook. So all of our lectures, or most of our lectures, will come from that book, and your quizzes, as well as the overview for the final. So definitely get the book, get a used copy, get whatever is cheapest version for you, but that is going to be a necessary component for this course. Okay, so let's take a look at it. what is marine biology. So the way I'm going to do these lectures is... I want you guys to fill in the blanks as we go through these topics. That way you're actively involved in the lecture instead of just sitting and watching and you know listening a little bit. Fill in the blanks here. So all of these lectures will have this design and this style. I'm going to give you a little bit of information, but then fill in the blanks. So marine biology, that's the study of organisms that live in the sea. Pretty self-explanatory. Biology is a study of life. Marine biology is specifically life in the ocean or life in the sea. Now, as we look at marine biology, it's an applied field that encompasses a lot of different areas of science. So you have geology, you have chemistry, you have physics, you have meteorology, you have climatology, you have zoology, you have botany, you have microbiology, etc., etc., etc. There are tons and tons of different fields of biology associated with marine biology. So to say I'm a marine biologist, that's a very broad and vague term. You need to be more specific. What aspect of marine biology do you study? Is it the ocean currents? Is it specifically the bacteria in the ocean or the algae, etc.? So we want to be a little more specific if we're going to become a marine biologist and look at one specific area of this field of study. So as we look at marine biology, it's studying the life from the microscopic organisms all the way up to the largest organisms on Earth. So you're looking at this entire spectrum and trying to look at how everything connects. So generally we look at life on land, well marine biology is studying life in the ocean and looking at the same aspects, interactions, species diversity, climate factors, all those things we would study on land as a biologist, we do the same thing in the ocean. It's just a little more challenging of an environment to study, and there's still a lot to be learned and explored and discovered in this field. Great opportunity for people who want to do new research. There's so much we still don't know about the ocean. So, so the marine ecosystem is what we're going to be looking at, the, kind of the big picture. This ecosystem has a major influence on the Earth. Half of the Earth's oxygen production comes from the ocean. Okay, So that's a huge amount of oxygen. That helps regulate the entire climate of our planet. So as the ocean changes, that influences climate change. And we're seeing that happen. It's occurring in front of our eyes right now. We get food production. So that fish to the right, it's a snapper. Odds are, if you guys have been to the ocean, you probably have had grilled snapper, fried snapper, snapper in soup, or ceviche, or different dishes. It's a major, major source of food for a lot of people on Earth. We get medicines from the ocean. We're learning all sorts of new things about different drugs that can be made from things that live in the ocean. And the proteins and the toxins and the things they produce has direct application into the medical field. Um, coastline, that picture on the bottom there. The marine ecosystem helps protect coastlines. A healthy, viable marine ecosystem keeps your coastline stable. When you destroy the ecosystem or alter it, 
coastlines become less stable. And then different aspects of the marine ecosystem actually help make land. So these are mangroves in the bottom right picture. Mangroves will actually reclaim land from the ocean. They build islands, they build soil, they trap nutrients, and they form land. So the marine ecosystem is very broad and diverse. And we're going to see that when we're in the field. We'll explore different parts of it. Um, but we want to we get a bigger picture of this is a big part of our planet. How does it impact all of us? Now, to look at marine biology, I want to kind of look at a little bit of the history of it. At this time, scientists know humans were using marine environments at least 165,000 years ago. They discovered stone blades in a cave in South Africa that was right on the coast there, showing humans were living there, or human ancestors, hominid ancestors, were living on the coast, using the cave, accessing the, sh the ocean for food or travel or who knows what. But there was a direct connection there. We see these beads here. Those date back 110,000 years ago. Now, whether the beads were used for jewelry, for a form of currency, we can only speculate. But it shows a connection to the marine ecosystem that early people had. And it was an important part of their lives. So um, most of the early knowledge of marine biology comes from early, early explorations. Pacific Islanders and the Phoenicians were sailing the oceans. The ancient Greeks knew about the ocean. So if you read different stories, the Odyssey and different uh, books about the ancient Greeks, they're talking about the oceans. That's a big part of their life. You know, they lived in the Mediterranean there and the ocean influenced their lives every day. Aristotle, he's actually credited with being the first marine biologist. He discovered gills were the breathing apparatus of fish. So very early, early knowledge about fish and marine life was gained from the ancient Greeks and these other cultures. So it's not a new thing for us to be interested and excited about exploring the marine ecosystem. We're just advancing our knowledge. We can go back to the Vikings, 9th and 10th century AD. The Vikings actually discovered what they called Vinland. That's North America. They were here first. Well, Native Americans were here first. The Vikings were the first Europeans to discover North America. But then that died out for 400, almost 500 years until Columbus in 1492 rediscovered the New World. You know, Columbus's journey and discovery of the New World in 1492. Uh, Ferdinand Magellan, 1519, voyaged around the world. So we're seeing people exploring broader swaths of the marine environment as they became more knowledgeable, as technology improved, as their boats improved, as the maps improved, they started expanding out and pushing the envelope and going where others had never gone before. Um, Captain James Cook, 1768, actually did a voyage around the world. Uh, what was important about his voyage, he was one of the first captains or first sailors to actually have a naturalist on his crew. Now, a naturalist is a person who their job is not to sail. Their job is to inventory resources. What animals did they come across? What plants did they come across? What different resources could they find if they moved and made port at this island or along this coastline or that coastline? And Cook's voyage, they did extensive mapping and specimen collection during his voyage around the world. Now we jump forward into the 1800s and we get the famous Charles Darwin. 1831, a five-year journey on the HMS Beagle. His job was to be a naturalist, collect specimens, identify them, tag them, send them back to England so they can inventory it. That was his job. What we want to fill in in the blank there, what Darwin did for the field of marine biology, and you guys will see this when we get into Belize and there will be articles about it, he actually came up with an explanation for how atolls form, the formation of atolls. Atolls are unique geological structures that occur in the oceans. 
Darwin figured this out back in the 1830s and 40s. We're still using that knowledge today when we go out to Glover's Reef and we look at that atoll, or if you ever go to Lighthouse Reef or Turnafee Atoll and look at those atolls, we know more about or we understand the tolls better because of Darwin's work back in the 1830s and 1840s. Okay. So another major voyage that influenced marine biology was Charles Wilkes, 1838 to 1842. He was chartered or part of the U.S. Navy, 1,500 miles of Antarctica. He charted this, the Pacific Northwest, islands in the South Pacific, over 2,000 species were collected during his journey, and it was the first U.S. government-sponsored international survey. So being part of the Navy, the government was paying for his employment, paying for this survey. The big asterisk there, this established government funding for scientific research. That is still essential today for new research to be conducted you need a lot of funding and government sources are typically one of the best sources of funding to be able to do research to add knowledge to the database of scientific information provide value with that information so Wilkes started that idea back in the 1830s and 40s with his voyage today marine biologists are still following the same pattern of using government funding to support their research. So anybody in this course or who is involved with us who goes into marine biology, expect to write grants to get money to pay for your research. That's how it works in science today. So now modern marine biology happens or works based out of marine labs. So instead of doing everything off of a boat, we now have physical infrastructure at different locations around the world. One of the, the first U.S. Marine Lab was in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And they're all over the world. They're scattered throughout the Caribbean. There's multiple marine labs in Belize. Um, Caribou Key has a marine field station that is sponsored by the Smithsonian Institution. Um, we see them um, on Turnafee Atoll. There's Calabash Key. We have one out on Ambergris Key. They're, they're all over the place where scientists are desiring to be close to the organisms that they're studying and work with them in the field instead of collecting them, throwing them on a boat, taking them back to a lab somewhere, and most likely everything dying. So this gives us an opportunity to get up close and personal in the marine world and study these specimens better. And sometimes you're actually going to be in the ocean doing your research versus in a laboratory next to the ocean. So the modernization of marine biology has really changed the field significantly. Now, tools used for this, pretty broad spectrum. And as technology changes, our knowledge changes and our ability to do different research changes. So again, you think about what Darwin and earlier scientists, they were just doing it basically with pencil paper and their, their intellectual abilities. Today, we have sensing, remote sensing with satellites to study the ocean. We have sonar, we have scuba equipment, we have ROVs, these remotely operated vehicles. We have huge, huge opportunities to learn more about the marine world because of the advances in technology. And it's up to us to see where do we want to take it? How far do we want to go? What new developments or new advances do we want to make? Do we need to develop technology to support that research? And that's something that you guys will start to learn is, ooh, here's a great idea, something I'd really love to do, but the technology's not there yet. Just give it time. It might be two years, it might be five years, ten years, but all of a sudden, oh, the technology's there, now we can do that research. You guys get an idea. If the technology's not there, figure out how to develop that technology. That's the key. And in order to do all of this, we're going to use a scientific method. So we'll talk about the scientific method in our next lecture over Chapter 1, The Science of Marine Biology.